All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God, and we are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. And our baptism, then, he adopts us as his children. He clothes us with the robe of his righteousness, and he gives to us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words from Luther's small catechism. Baptism means that the day of sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, therefore, let us confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, and at this time we'll continue with the baptism of the Holy God. Dear Ben and Katie, our Lord Jesus Christ, in instituting baptism, not only commanded that children should be baptized, but that they should be taught to obey everything that he has commanded us. I therefore ask you, do you intend to bring up Odi in the way of the Lord and to instruct him in the truths of God's saving word, so that he may grow in his faith? 
serve God in the Christian life, and remain in his baptismal grace all the days of his life. If you are willing to do so, answer, yes, and we ask God to help us. Yes, and we ask God to help us. We will join our hearts together in prayer. We pray. We give thanks, most merciful Father, that you have received Bodhi as your own child and made him a member of Christ's body of the church. Now we pray that you would grant to Bodhi and to all your church on earth that, being dead to sin, we may live to righteousness and being buried with Christ into his death, we may also share in his resurrection, so that with all your saints we may inherit eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. King of glory, you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand, you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, as you have already done, and holy baptism. That, at your command, by your power, we may be strengthened by you in our faith, and that we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. In the peace of sins forgiven, in which we just witnessed in a powerful way in Cody's baptism, we have the joy of going back to God's Word and learning more from Him this morning as we go to the Word portion of our service. As we do so, we'll start a little differently this morning. We'll actually start with our psalm, which is Psalm 124. We'll sing that psalm this morning, but instead of using the psalms that we often do at the beginning of the hymnal, we'll use hymn 866 in the hymnal if God had not been on our side. On the whole, the words of its title and the words that we find throughout its three verses, this hymn echoes the words of Psalm 124 beautifully. Words which help us today as we play God's waiting game. Again, we'll sing hymn 866 in the back of your hymnal.
Today's first reading from Acts chapter 1 takes place right after Jesus' ascension into heaven, which again we'll hear about in our sermon today. Here in Acts 1, we see how the early New Testament church played God's leading game. Far from being upset and depressed that Jesus had now left them and returned to heaven, we see that they found profound purpose in the work Jesus had left them to do. Work that was all about witnessing to others that simple truth of Easter. He lives. We have a Savior who grows. We listen as God speaks these words to us here. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. When the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, the Sabbath day walk from the city, and when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. At those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and also with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and he said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, that being Judas Iscariot, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he had received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language at Keldama, that is, the field of blood. For Peter said, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one there to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary for us to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism, the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of the resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called our Sabbath, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then we continue with today's second reading from 1 Peter chapter 3, which continues our set of Easter readings from the epistle of 1 Peter. Uh, here, Peter acknowledges some of the difficulties we face as we find ourselves waiting in this life. But Peter also directs us to where we can always find help in Jesus, who is our risen and ascended Lord. And one special way that Christ helps us in baptism. We listen once more as God shares this with us through the Apostle Peter. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good. But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered. Once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 
He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism. That now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ who has gone into heaven and who is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll continue with our hymn of the day as we focus our hearts to uh, listen to God's word in our sermon. Our hymn of the day is Jesus Christ, my sure defense. It's in 446. If you're following in the hymnal, and we'll sing stanzas one through three and also stanza five. Not so much fun also. 
If you are dreading an upcoming event that you do not want to go to, or you're worried about what a judge or a governing board is going to say about a particular decision, or if you're just worried about getting the test results back from the doctor, in those cases, you may hate waiting. It can be excruciating. It can be the exact opposite of what you would call fun. In many ways, waiting describes what we are doing in our lives here as Christians. And namely, we are playing God's waiting game. And by that we mean, as we're talking about today, Jesus has ascended into heaven, and we are left here on this earth, well, waiting. So, what are we supposed to be doing now, and, and how should we look at this wait as we wait for Christ to return, or wait to die, and for the Lord to take us home to heaven? Is, is this wait a good thing, or is it a bad thing? Well, the early Christian church also played this waiting game, and as we got a hint of in our readings earlier, although there were certainly difficulties involved with them as they waited, we also got a hint from God that Ultimately, this way, it was a good thing. God was going to accomplish good things through it. And that's also what God shares with us today as we take a look at the account of Jesus' ascension. As we are now waiting for Christ here on this earth, ultimately, that is a good thing. And it all boils down to that same truth we've been repeating ever since Easter, that simple matter of Jesus' resurrection. Because he lives that changes how we look at our way here on this earth. That's what God shares with you and me today in Luke's account of Jesus' ascension. They were in Luke 24, and we'll begin with verse 44. We read, Jesus said to them, the them being those 11 disciples that we heard about in our first reading, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. So by the way, what we're talking about there is the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, which we'll talk about more as we celebrate Pentecost next week. I will send you what my Father has promised, the Holy Spirit, but wait. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When Jesus had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they waited, and that is, they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This is the word of the Lord. And so, as we think about it, God's waiting game, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Well, we're told Jesus left them and was taken up into heaven. In other words, Jesus ascended, he is gone. And as these disciples are left waiting, how do they react? We're told very plainly in verse 52. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. In short, the Bible uses the disciples' example to tell us that this wait, it was a good thing. Do you agree with that? Because I'll be honest, I, I know I don't. Not always. How often do we find ourselves waiting here on this earth? We just get overcome with despair, depression, worry, anxiety, and, and maybe in those moments you think to yourself, God has promised us all sorts of good things. Just read the Bible. They're all there. Where are these good things in my life? And in those moments, then it becomes really easy to just sit around in your hands and think, okay, any time now, Lord. And what do we do? We, we turn that way into a little bath. Whether we 
realize that we're not in those moments. That's us doubting God's power. That's us thinking that either God doesn't realize what's going on with me, or he doesn't have the power to help me with this, or, or even that if he does realize what's going on, and he does have the power, then he must not care about me. And whenever we think that way, that reveals a lack of faith, and ultimately, that's sin too. And it's sin that's so easy to fall into. It can happen to the best of Christians, in a manner of speaking. And even take Martin Luther, the, uh, the so-called founder of our Lutheran faith, he once found himself so depressed and so overcome with emotion in his life that he shut himself in a room and he refused to come out. Didn't matter how much his wife he ate, he insisted that he come out or try to get him out of the room, and he just stayed in there. So what did his wife Katie do? She was a good wife. She decided to dress in all black. A black dress, a black veil, a black hat, walking around the house until her husband Martin finally noticed it and he was confused. He asked her, Katie, what's going on? Who died? To which she quickly responded, oh, haven't you heard, Martin? God is dead. Now, of course, Luther being this famous German reformer, good pastor, says, that's blasphemy, but there's no way that God is dead. But then his wife Katie responded to him, well, no, of course he's not dead, but since you're going around moping, acting like he is dead, I thought I'd join you in your mourning. They were Germans, they were a sarcastic bunch. And it worked, it, it broke him out of that. How often is that us? How often do we go around this earth and really we act, we think as though God is dead? And again, it can happen to anyone. Nobody is immune from this, even those disciples, right? What a wonderful example of faith, as we just heard about in our gospel reading, our first lesson. And yet, do you know what Jesus told those same disciples just 43 days earlier on Monday, Thursday? He had to say to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Have faith. Have faith in God and faith in me. And the reason Jesus had to say that was because it's the disciples looked ahead to Jesus' death, which happened between Monday, Thursday, and his ascension. They didn't look like what we just read. They didn't have great joy. They were overcome with fear and anxiety, and so Jesus had to encourage them in this way. They struggled with this as well. And yet, that didn't stay that way, right? Because as we heard, they overcame those thoughts. They were filled with joy in the end, and Jesus did lead them. So why was that? What made the difference for the disciples? And finally, what can make the difference for us as we lay here on this earth? Well, to go back to our sermon text, God's word to us, it's all found in verse 46. Again, Jesus told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. And remember, after he speaks these words, Jesus goes up to heaven. Again, he, he leaves them, but far from them acting as though God is now dead, like they had done in the past, they believed in the living God, a Savior whom they had seen risen from the grave on the third day, and, and therefore a Savior whom they trusted really had forgiven their sins. He really had done all the things that he said they would. He had even forgiven their lack of faith. That's what made the difference for the disciples just 43 days later. And finally, that's what can make a difference for you and for me at any time. The simple fact that Jesus lives. And first and foremost, why does Jesus live? He lives to take away all of our sins. And so whenever in this life we are acting as though God is dead and we reveal our sin in that way and our worry and our anxiety and things like that. Or whenever in our life we succumb to other really bad sins that we're not even getting into this morning. Whenever that happens to you, whenever it happens to me, let us stop. Let us, first of all, repent of that sin. And then let us turn in faith to Jesus and let us see what we heard today in God's word that Jesus suffered and died to take away that sin. That sin died when Jesus died along with him. And that sin was buried in the ground when Jesus was buried in the ground. 
But then when Jesus rose from the grave, what did he do? He left sin and death behind. And then he freed us. He gave us new life, free from their guilt. Again, Jesus lives, first and foremost, to take away all of our sin, all of our shortcomings before the Lord. And then not only that, but Jesus also lives to take care of his body, the church, to take care of us from heaven. And so whenever we find ourselves in this life acting as though, thinking as though God is dead, sometimes we just need to stop and, and remember the simple truth. Yeah, Jesus did die, but he rose again. <laughs> He's not still in the grave. Jesus rose, and not only did he rise, but he ascended to God's right hand in heaven, where he's going to take care of all things for us because he loves us. And he's going to use all of God's power there to do so. And that's something we're reminded of in a beautiful way this morning in the waters of holy baptism. Like Bodhi, each one of us was born into this world with a, a deep genetic problem. Namely, we were not born in the perfect image of our Heavenly Father. We were not born into this world as God's child, but we were born into this world as children of our parents, resembling them, inheriting their sinful image. That was a problem. So, out of love for us, what did Jesus do? He used all of his authority at God's right hand to adopt us. That's what the Bible tells us in the waters of holy baptism. God makes us his children. Galatians 3 talks about that. And therefore, if that's true, well then in the waters of holy baptism, God really must be scrubbing our souls clean of their sin. He really must be saving us, as we just heard in our second reading in 1 Peter chapter 3. He really is giving us that clean conscience, that right to come before God as if we were a child coming before our Father in heaven. That's what we have in baptism. And that's something we can always fall back on as we wait here on this earth. No matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what despair or anxiety or depression you face, no matter what you do that is wrong or the wrong things that are done to you, no matter any of that, what's still true at the end of the day? You are still God's child. And you still have a heavenly father. And like any parent is going to take care of their child, you can be sure that God is going to take care of you. Even if, like our children, you don't understand what's going on. That's okay. There's only one thing you need to understand. Are you baptized? And if so, that means you are God's child. And God is going to take care of you. That's the certain promise that God attaches in his word to baptism. That is the certain promise that even our littlest ones here in this room share because of their baptism. And that's the certain promise that Bodhi shares in his world today. And so you think back to our theme, God's waiting game. It's not such a bad thing. Not when you realize whose you are and that God's going to take care of you. It's not a bad thing. And also, just like other forms of waiting, it's not so bad when you also have something to occupy your time. That, that's something else, too, that's important for us to realize. Because nowhere in the Bible does God tell us to just sit around on our hands like we often find ourselves doing here on this earth. No! He's got stuff for us to do. And in fact, he, he told us what that stuff is in our sermon text. Once more, uh, going to verse 47, notice what Jesus said there. He said, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, in Jesus' name. And it was us, of course, but also, he said, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And that's where you and I come in. This Jesus went on to say, you are witnesses of these things. Now I get it. Jesus was talking to his disciples here. But how does this not apply to us when, in a sense, we are witnesses of these things, too? I mean, in a world where most people feel like God is dead, you and I know that Jesus lives. We believe that he rose from the grave. 
you see, that's just it. Why, why are we still waiting here on this earth? If, if you're really one of them, if you know about Jesus, why doesn't God just take you there and free you from all the bad things that happen on earth that make this way a bad thing? Well, because it's not just about you. It's not just about me. There are others who don't know about the good things that are coming someday. Others who will never find those good things unless somebody tells them about it, brings it to them. Do you ever think about that? You have something simply in your faith in Jesus that other people desperately need. People you love. And your kids, too. They need to be raised in this truth so that they've got it. And it's why as we celebrate Pentecost next week, as we transition to what we think of as the church half of the year, where we get away a little bit from the specific events of Jesus' life, we're going to be talking about how in our ministry as a congregation and in our lives as Christians, we can share this good news of Jesus with others. In fact, that's what both of our next two worship series here at Greece are going to be about. We're going to talk about the ministry of the church for a few weeks, and then we're going to talk about what it means to be a Christian. And so if you're thinking to yourself, Okay, Jesus has let me work to do. How do I do it? How do I share with others that Jesus is the Savior who takes away their sin? How can I live my life in a way that is different, that is better, that reflects it just in my actions? If you don't know the answer to those questions, keep coming back. In some ways, that's what the Pentecost season of the church here is all about. It equips us to do that. But then for now, just simply know this. This waiting game is we're here on earth. Not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Even if you're ready to go to heaven, there's still so much good that you and I can do for others. Even if it gets us nothing, like we talked about last week. But then today we also see the other half of the equation. Whatever needs we do have here on this earth, we can trust that Christ will take care of them. Because that's what he's ascended to heaven to do. To take care of things for his church here on earth. And again, he has made us his children, God's children in baptism. Well, just like you will take care of all of the needs of your children, you'll go out of your way to give them whatever they need. You can trust that God is going to do the same thing for you here on earth, no matter what you're going through, even if you struggle to understand it at times. All because of Jesus. So, the waiting game. It's easy to think of it as either a good thing or a bad thing, but truthfully, it's honest. There is often a mixture of the two, isn't it? Even when you are really excited for something to come, that excitement can be populated by butterflies and, and nerves in your stomach. For example, ladies, if you're about to give birth to a child, you can't wait to hold that newborn in your hands. But you could wait on all the pain and misery and suffering that come with the birthing process. Or let's say you're about to host a, a big event at home or, or here at Grace. We've hosted a couple of big events in the last years, we hosted the event for the dedication of this remodeled facility, and we had a pastor's conference about a month ago. Both of those things, as a pastor, I was excited for. I could not wait to host those events to have people come here. And yet, I couldn't wait on all the work and the worry that goes along with hosting those kinds of events. And I see some of you nod, and you get it too when you host those events in your own life. Well, so also, that's God's waiting game. God never promises that it's going to be easy. In fact, he tells us the opposite. Because of sin, he says we will have trouble in our lives. I mean, finally, we live in a world, we live in a place where people can be taken away from us. They can die. That's never going to be easy. But just like we see with a Christian funeral, well, we may mourn as Christians when we lose those close to us. That does not mean we mourn as the world does, without any hope, because we know something simple. We're going to see them again. And likewise, though we may find ourselves in despair at times as Christians living in this world, just like anybody else, we don't find ourselves in despair as those who have no hope, because we know this is all going to work out someday. And in both cases, and in every case, it's all because of that simple truth. Jesus lives. Finally, that's what all good things in our life boil down to and come from. And that's why, even as we wait here on this earth, it can be a good thing, even with some of the bad. 
as long as we have Jesus, as long as we have a not dead Savior who's still left in the ground, but a living Savior who rose from the grave and rose to heaven to God's right hand, where he will take care of us. After all, we are baptized. We are his children. Amen. Please stand. And now may this peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds with faith in Christ Jesus, the life which is everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with our confession of faith. One more time in this Easter season, we'll use the confession of faith that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We confess together. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. What is this good news that saves us? We confess with Paul. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to see us and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. These witnesses testified, so there would be no doubt, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and we will too. This is most certainly true. Please be seated, and we'll continue with the collection of the offering and also the children's room. And so at this time, I invite the young kids of the congregation to come up for the children's room. Maybe you don't have to get any more shots. He's healed you. You're happy that the 
doctor goes away. Well, the reason I wanted to talk to you about that today is because it makes us think of what Jesus, our Savior, did. So, Jesus, at the end of his life, he ascended. That means he went up into heaven. So he left this earth, and he went to heaven. And we are told that when he ascended into heaven, what do you think? His disciples, his closest friends, how do you think they felt when he left? You'd think so, right? I feel sad, too. In fact, don't we sometimes feel sad that it would be really nice if Jesus were right here, if God were taking care of us, right? It can be kind of sad. Well, and he is right here, right? Because Jesus is God, and he'd be anywhere. We just don't see him. And, yeah, we, we'd expect that they'd be sad. But you want to hear something crazy? The disciples, they were actually very happy. They were filled with great joy. Now, that may seem kind of strange. Why would they be happy that Jesus left them? But think about it like a doctor. When a doctor uses all the tools to heal you, and then he goes away, are you happy? Yeah, because you're healed. You don't need anything else from him. Well, Jesus has kind of done the same thing with us. So Jesus, he healed us. What problem did we have? It's not the type of problem a doctor fixes, like a cut or something wrong with your heart, but we have a problem even deeper inside of us. Yeah, we have sin, right? You guys know what sin is? It's when we... We don't do the things we're supposed to be. We don't listen to our parents. We're mean to someone. We hurt others, right? We sin in a lot of ways, don't we? And that's... Well, and you got blood drawn from a doctor, right? So that's different. But then the sin inside of us, that's a whole different problem. And the doctor can't help us with that sin. But Jesus can. What did, what did Jesus do to heal us from that sin? Yeah, so even though we should be punished for our sin, Jesus was punished instead on the cross so that we wouldn't have to be because he loves us. And he loves you too. So Jesus took away our sin. And you know what? Jesus even has some tools that he uses to give that to us. Now for us, it's not a stethoscope or a syringe. But what Jesus uses is the tool that we use every Sunday here at church. What does daddy, or pastor, for the rest of you, read from up there at the pulpit? The Bible. The Bible, right? That is the tool that Jesus uses. So like the doctor uses his tools to tell us what he's done for us. Or... We saw another special tool that Jesus uses today. Voting especially saw it, and Kendrick was up close to. What's the other tool that Jesus uses? Baptism. baptism, yeah. He uses baptism to wash that sin away from us. That's what God promises in the Bible. And then on Sundays when us adults walk to receive Lord's Supper, that's another tool that he uses to take away our sins. So let me ask you, if Jesus is taking away all of our sins, do we actually need him to be sitting here where we can see him right next to us? No, he can go away because he took care of all those problems for us, just like the doctor can leave. And then Jesus sends us doctors and policemen and parents and everything we need to help take care of us here on this earth for our other problems, too. So even though sometimes it's sad that we don't see Jesus here and we wish we could just sit and talk with him, we can still be okay and happy because we know, you know what? Jesus, like a doctor, healed us. And that means it's actually okay he's not right here with us because he took care of what we needed him to take care of. Let's pray about that, all right? So we'll fold our hands, and we'll bow our heads, and we pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for healing us from all our sins and giving us all that we need on this earth. Please help us to be happy and excited as we wait for you to take us home to heaven someday. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Let's say it together. Amen. All right, thanks all of you for coming up. We'll see you later. Like the early 
disciples lead us to work and witness for you and protect us from all spiritual danger and harm as we wait for you. Lord of the Church, both in the last week and in the coming week, graduates from our Synod's College and Seminary are receiving their first calls to full-time work in your kingdom. We thank you that you have moved the hearts of these individuals to dedicate their lives to witness about you to young and old alike. Be with them as they go to their first fields of labor and give them confidence that you will continue to be with them in all things. Move those congregations to which they have been called to receive them with love. Grant that their labors in those places may be of mutual benefit and blessing. Good Shepherd, due to the shortage of pastors and teachers in their synod, there will also be many churches that do not receive the workers for which they have hoped and prayed. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. We tell us in your word. Send your spirit into the hearts of young people that more may give themselves to be full-time servants in your kingdom. Be with those congregations that did not receive pastors or teachers. Comfort them with the same hope of your resurrection. Supply what they need according to your wisdom and power. And grant them patience as they continue to wait. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. Dear Savior, you live to make intercession for your people. Hear us from your Father's right hand when we call upon you, and cause the prayer you have taught us to be acceptable at the Father's throne of grace. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us in our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. Equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And we'll close our service with our final hymn, a hymn that captures the joy of ascension, a hymn of glory let us sing. It's in 472, and if you're following along in the hymn, we'll sing stanzas one, two, and five. <laughs>
verses. We didn't get to it in today's service, but we'll end with it. Romans chapter 6 says, We were therefore buried with Christ through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Again, another reminder that with baptism, even though it's easy to think of it as a sacrifice, it's something we do for God, something to show who we are. The way the Bible talks about it is as a sacrament, as a sacred thing God does for us. In this case, a way that he leads us to participate in Jesus' burial and his resurrection. He takes away our sins. As we heard in our second reading in 1 Peter chapter 3. What an awesome thing to celebrate that with the dolls today and celebrate Bodhi's baptism. He truly is a child of God. God has washed his sins away. And that's a comfort we can all take to heart. In your baptism, you always have a Heavenly Father. And from God's right hand, Christ is going to take good care of you, no matter what you face in this life. Some announcements then as we look ahead. Uh, just a reminder today that we have a leadership team meeting after church. And then we also have our final examination for our catechism students. Um, as a reminder, the families are invited to that. We'll also have uh, pizza a little bit before that at 1.15. Uh, so that's what we got going on after church today. Also, speaking of things going on after church, well, this week and next week, uh, we are going to be having cake. Uh, so the family would love for you to have some cake with them after the service to celebrate with them today for we baptism. And then as we have the uh, confirmation of um, Zane Berkeley. And Sydney Ederson next week, we're going to have cake also to celebrate with them as they become adult community members of our congregation. Some other announcements. Uh, this Wednesday, Bible study, 7 o'clock. We'll continue looking at the book of Genesis, chapters 24 and 25. Uh, this coming Saturday, please note there is no women's Bible study, but there will be women's Bible study the next Saturday on June 3rd. Uh, the ladies will do chapters 7 and 8. Will that finish that Bible study? No. So there will be, that Bible study on June 3rd, and then there will be another break because we're out of town on vacation, so Heather will not be around to lead it, but we'll have to finish it later on in the summer here. So stay tuned for announcements. Um, anybody else have, oh, well, I should mention, come to church next weekend too. We have Bible study and Sunday school before the service, and then we'll have a special worship service, not a part of any worship series, but we'll celebrate the day of Pentecost and talk about what that's about, and of course we'll, we'll celebrate along with that fittingly uh, our confirmation for Sydney and Zane. Other than that, uh, anybody else have any announcements they would like to share with the congregation? Seeing none, I do have one more thing to share with you. Um, those members of our church know this already, uh, but I'll share it with you visitors if you're wondering what is the pastor talking about here. Um, in our church body, we have a call system where if a church finds themselves in need, uh, as a pastor, you can end up in a call list and get called to serve another church. Uh, so then you, you wait between your current call at this church here at Grace and the other church. Uh, so in the past few weeks, I've uh, made a decision on that call, and I've got a letter from myself that I'll, I'll read to you here. Dear brothers and sisters in the faith, over the past few weeks, I've had much to think about as I considered an additional divine call to serve the members of the Messiah Lutheran Church in Green Bay, Wisconsin. After much prayer and careful consideration, I decided to return my call to Green Bay and will remain here in my heart. It is always a fascinating and humbling thing to go through the call process, to consider my strengths and my weaknesses, to learn about how I might serve elsewhere, and to think about whether a change would be best for God's work in both churches. Indeed, I have at times wondered whether the grass is greener elsewhere, especially with other calls where I have felt well suited for the work. That leads me to the words of Isaiah the prophet, which I also shared in my letter to the saints at Messiah. Isaiah 55, verse 10, As the rain and snow come down from the heaven, and do not return to them without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so God says, is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Well, I felt quite capable of the work at Messiah and what they were asking me to do. One thought I could not escape during this deliberation was that the grass is very green here in mind. Right now, I'm not just talking about the green grass with all the rain we've been having. Um, but despite our ups and downs, we've seen how God has always worked through His Word to care for and nourish our young mission congregation. And then recently, it does feel like God may have additional growth in mind for his church here in the near future. And that was one main reason why it seemed great to stay here, as I deliberated this call. 
after all the work just to get settled into our building as our mission is now. Uh, it seems like this is a time for stability and to, uh, and to build rather than a time for even more changes, which we've become all too familiar with as a new congregation. Uh, so whether you are new to our congregation or you've been here since we first started the congregation, please know it's a joy and a privilege to continue to serve you. Even more, please share in my excitement of all the opportunities ahead and let us look for opportunities to be involved in the work of our congregation that God has given to us. Finally, as Isaiah encourages us, may God continue to unite us by his word. May we trust that he will use this message to accomplish exactly what he desires here at Grace. And may we work all the harder to bring this good news of Jesus to others. So that's that. Until six months from now, when I'm eligible, and I'll no doubt receive another call. As we talk about in prayer, um, there are many vacancies in our church body. We need more pastors and teachers. We're getting a shot of them with our graduation process from our students' call worker facilities uh, right now. Uh, but we're, we still need a lot more good workers. So uh, pray for those churches. Uh, pray that the Lord will lead young men and women to serve. And also pray for your brothers and sisters in the faith at Messiah in Green Bay as they continue the process of calling for a second pastor. All right. God bless you. Good to worship with you today. We'll see you on the way out again. Be sure to stick around and enjoy some cake with the dolls. <laughs>